Hello, everyone, and welcome to Forehead Sick, previously known as Heads Up, the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, founder of Migraine Nation and chronic daily migraine survivor. I am here today with one of our most popular guests. I'm here with Dr. Tim Smith. Hello, Dr. Smith. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on again. Thank you for being here. So Dr. Smith is a favorite here on our show because of his extensive experience in migraine clinical trials as the CEO of Study Metrics Research. He is also a board member on the Nash at the National Headache Foundation. He always has so much new information to tell us. Everyone is always excited to hear what he has to say. So today, we have a new thing here at Forehead Sake. We're going to dedicate one episode a month to news bites, news, headache news, uh, FDA approvals, things migraine related in the news. And that is what we are here to do today. So we are going to start with a recent publication in Headache that looked at um, COVID and, and headache. And we have been waiting for information like this to come out for a very long time. And so I can't wait to get the news bite of what was in this article. So let's discuss what they found. I do think, Dr. Smith, that one of the main questions most of us have had for a long time has to do with whether COVID can flare up our existing migraine or headache disorder, and if it resolves or if it could stay there forever. What did they find? Uh, so the answer to those two questions are yes and usually. So uh, <laughs> Uh, the huh. COVID infection uh, frequently does exacerbate uh, migraine uh, and other headache disorders. For that matter, about 50% of patients with uh, COVID have headache uh, as one of their primary symptoms. And so your migraine uh, patients do uh, tend to have flares of their migraine attacks. And they mm -hmm. usually go away with resolution, but uh, there are clearly some cases where this long COVID uh, kind of uh, uh, syndrome can involve uh, continuance of an of a of a headache exacerbation. Okay, so an, another thing that I've been hearing so much about online and in person is people have been asking about new daily persistent headache after a diagnosis of COVID, uh, otherwise known as just NDPH. Did they find anything out about people um, developing NDPH after COVID? Yeah, so uh, they, this is definitely seen, and this was a literature review, so they re reviewed dozens of papers where these were these cases were reported, and uh, there does look like there's a connection to a new, new uh, daily persistent uh, headache, um, and it's COVID will probably become one of the underlying causes of that, although by definition, we don't know what causes NDPH, but this right. uh, is going to cause a lot of presentations of new daily headache where none existed before. Okay. Um, so another recent study in that same journal looked at the association between body mass and index, which I think most of us know is just a measure of our weight related to our height and migraine. Now, this is something we have talked about on the podcast before with Dr. Amelia Barrett, um, because people were really wondering why on earth their headache specialist or their doctor were bringing up weight in a headache visit. And it was starting to almost bother some people like, well, how on earth could this be related? Um, so there is some new data out on that. And I wanted to see if you could just really quickly tell us what it said. Sure. And this was a, um, another um, sort of cross-sectional study where they took a bunch of records and looked at them and, and uh, analyzed the differences between populations. And so if you look at uh, um, this study, it confirms that, that uh, high body mass index is associated with uh, increased migraine uh, severity. And uh, but the interesting part was that uh, low body mass index too uh, is also associated with increase. So it's kind of like a U-shaped curve if you look right. at it from low to high. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was a, kind of a confirming thing. We've always known that that uh, being overweight is a primary one of the uh, known associations with chronification of migraine. And this is another confirming um, uh, paper that actually looked at it from the other way around. Right. So if you are one of those people that has really severe nausea and vomiting along with your migraine, you have trouble keeping weight on, 
you might be one of those people in the underweight category or the lower BMI category that they looked at. So it was interesting that they did look at both sides, uh, being at more risk, whether you are on the lower side or the higher side of the BMI categories. Was there a BMI that was found to have the lowest migraine risk, like a particular BMI? Um, it was uh, usually in this survey uh, around 20, um, uh, in the 20s was considered okay. to be ideal. It started going up after 29 and below 20, it was, you know, the severity started and frequency of attacks started going up again. So the okay. bottom of the U curve was in the, in the BMIs in the 20s. And the healthiest BMIs are between, you know, 20, 25. 20 is pretty thin, by the way, actually, you know, when mm -hmm. most people look at that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, over 25 is considered to start getting into the overweight range and then over 30 is uh, consistent with uh, the definition of being obese uh, right which is, we don't like that term that's the sort of right. medical terminology for it okay so next we always do like to keep an eye out for any data having to do with new daily persistent headache or any other type of headache disorder besides migraine because th they are studied a little bit less um, there was a article that just recently came out about NDPH in the pediatric population, um, and it had some MRI findings in pediatric patients with NDPH. Can you tell us what they found? Sure. This was a, an MRI study uh, that was done <clears throat> uh, looking at, and it's what they call a cross-sectional study. So they had a group of, of uh, uh, adolescent uh, 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 patients with migraine, mm -hmm. um, and then they had a, a group of adolescent patients without migraine, and they had them age and gender uh, matched, uh, so, far, so on and so forth, and then they, they looked at the ultrastructural and uh, functional differences between the brains of those two groups, and the, mm -hmm. and the, um, uh, the uh, new daily persistent headache uh, children. I think I said migraine, but this yeah, is yeah, it's a DPH group. group. Yes, um, go ahead. Um, and so the uh, the 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 group with the NDPH had uh, a smaller uh, uh, decreased thickness of the of the cerebral cortex, and they also had some decrease in what they call functional connectivity between the regions of the of the, the certain regions of the brain that are involved with. Uh, emotional and cognitive um, connections and and uh, that may explain a lot as it pertains to uh, patients who have these uh, frustrating daily uh, unexplained uh, headache right. uh, disorders so yeah there was a functional and a, a, a structural slight structural difference between the two groups right so I think it's important that we don't want to uh without reason concern any parents out there. So this data, what is the reason for looking for this kind of data? It's not that they found anything necessarily wrong with their brains that is related to an outcome. It's more that they're looking for a marker or looking for something, a reason, right? Can you go ahead and delve into that a little bit? Sure, this is kind of what they call exploratory. They, mm -hmm. they didn't have a hypothesis of, you know, what was going to be different. They were just looking for differences in, in these cross sections of the of the populations. And, and uh, we don't know that this has any predictive significance. In other words, we wouldn't go out and do functional MRIs on people screening to see if we can find this thing uh, to, to explain. A, it's not diagnostic, in other words. Um, but uh, in the di in the differences, it's unclear, but it's it's definitely a significant uh, difference between the two groups. It gives us some clues on where to look next and some of the things that we need to do to try to explain the phenomenon even better. Because right now we just don't have anything to tell these uh, kids and, right. their, and their parents and uh, or anybody else for that matter. Uh, but it, the one thing I did want to point out though is this doesn't mean that there's uh, that these uh, uh, patients are at any kind of cognitive or intellectual disadvantage. There's nothing uh, predictive about outcomes on this. It doesn't mean that right. they'll have neurologic deficits or strokes or, uh, you know, uh, cognitive difficulty or mental health disorders going forward. It's just a structural and functional finding uh, that's unique to these MRI uh, um, uh, right. readings. And, um you know, that's, it gives us a place to look next, but it does confirm that this is something that uh, is uh, physiological and that there may be some other um, 
Well, there's definitely more work that needs to be done on it, but this gives us an idea and some things to look at for future studies. Right. Okay, so moving on to a study published last month that sort of caught my attention in the Journal of Headache and Pain. This, um, we are all hear so often that people with migraine have an increased risk of depression, an increased risk of anxiety. But what these authors chose to do was look at people who had migraine, but did not have a psychiatric history of either of these two things, and then compare them to a control group and see if there was anything different about them, even though they had not been diagnosed with depression or anxiety. What was the bottom line of this study? I guess the best way to sum it up is uh, even in patients that don't have a psychiatric diagnosis or not treated for psychiatric disorders, if you look at those uh, patients, and this is another comparison between patients without migraine, patients with episodic or, or um, less frequent migraine, and then the chronic migraine, people with 15 or more migraine days per month. And is it and when you look at those different groups and compare uh, how they perform on psychological testing uh, and the like, uh, the, the chronic migraine group does, does worse. And these are patients, remember, they don't have a psychiatric problem. They're not treated. Mm -hmm. They don't have a psychiatric diagnosis, but uh, they were uh, proved to have uh, some uh, psychiatric uh, uh, com comorbid indicators. Uh, episodic migraine more than the than, than the non-migraine population, but uh, chronic migraine, it sort of stair steps. As, as migraine gets worse, these markers tend to uh, appear. So those, if I remember right, weren't a lot of those, um, the categories that they fell into, weren't they related to sleep and insomnia? Yeah, was, yeah, but the chronic migraine group has uh, poor sleep quality, more sleep disturbance, you know, nighttime awakenings, uh, poor, they don't have rejuvenative or, or restful sleep. Mm -hmm. they, high, they have higher use of sleep medication, uh, more daytime dysfunction and, and more uh, severe symptoms of insomnia. And that right. seems to drive a lot of that, uh, of the uh, uh, symptoms that they're having. I'm guessing a lot of people listening right now can relate to that, the, the sleep yeah. issues. Was there anything else about that study that, that stood out that you would like to discuss before we move on? Well, as it turns out, the, and I may have mis, misstated this, but the, when they looked at the depression scores across the groups, uh, there was really no difference from non-migraine patients to episodic migraine to patients to chronic migraine, but, the, mm -hmm. but their sleep... Uh, um, uh, disturbance was uh, was a driver of of uh, poorer quality of life, and right. it seemed to be directly related to the to the frequency and and number of of migraine. Uh, right. It didn't really have much to do with uh, the patient's coping skills or their self efficacy or those kinds of things either. So it's a lot of times I think some physicians wrongly and other people you know uh, um, may wrongly uh, think that you know the patients. Uh, chronicity or frequency or severity of their migraine disorder may be directly related to their coping strategies and their abilities to uh, deal with uh, uncertainty and, and their decision-making styles. And, and the surveys in these uh, populations did not indicate that at all. In fact, they were identical across the populations, whether they had no migraine at all or whether they had chronic migraine. So that, right. I think that was a very important finding from that study. I thought that was very interesting too. So going on to a study that might be interesting to the many people in our audience who have tried multiple, multiple medications that failed them. Um, so it, this was a study on uh, Vyepti and which we have discussed numerous times on the podcast, but this particular study came out recently and looked at uh, how well Vyepti uh, performed in people who had uh, not really seen results previously on other multiple medications. Um, and I think everyone know, or many people know that Vyepti is one of the anti-CGRP medicines that's an infusion that is usually delivered um, quarterly. So um, go, can you go ahead and tell us about that data? Sure, so the primary uh, issue at hand was in the, in the pivotal studies that uh, got uh, this medication approved they excluded people that had failed 
a lot of previous medications. And right. so, um, and we usually do that just because we're trying not to uh, enroll refractory patients into the, the pivotal studies. Right. Uh, but uh, I think the, the sponsor company did the responsible thing and went back because these medications are many times only, insurance is only paid for them if, if patients have failed at least two treatments before. So they did exactly that. They went back and looked at that population that had failed two to four medications to, uh, since those will be the ones that will be primarily using this kind of medication and uh, uh, to look at that population. And the good news was it still works. So even mm -hmm. if patients have failed a beta blocker and, and topiramate or some other entry level, uh, you know, medication, um, the, their suspicions that uh, patients would not respond to this have not borne out when they looked at this study. So this was a good follow-up study to the pivotal data, and it adds a little more color commentary for this and gives us more confidence in using it patients that have failed medicines. Right. Okay. So there are a couple more uh, really interesting um, uh, papers or studies that came out re recently. The first one is a pilot study uh, that came out of Stanford, and it has to do with the brain-gut connection and the use of gamma core or non-invasive uh, vagus stimulation. So this is really interesting, especially to those of us that have a lot of issues with gastroparesis and nausea and vomiting. So what, what was found there? So uh, as you point out, the gastroparesis, or some people call it gastric stasis, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, just the stomach doesn't work right. The emptying mm -hmm. is delayed. Stomach emptying is delayed. And that's how fast food, you know, passes from the stomach into the small intestine. Usually it's about 90 minutes. Uh, for migraine patients, it's usually like two and a half hours to three hours. And when you're sick with a migraine, it can be even longer than that. Uh, and um, uh, the treatments are sparse. We use anti-nausea medicines for it. And it's very frustrating because those can cause side effects. And this open label uh, pilot study uh, done by the professionals at Stanford showed that using vagus nerve stimulation can improve all the cardinal symptoms of uh, gastric stasis or gastroparesis, meaning the bloating, the reflux kinds of symptoms, heartburn, fullness, uh, and even uh, uh, regurgitation can be improved in these mm -hmm. patients because uh, they can improve the forward flow. They get, the vagus nerve controls the intestinal flow and uh, forward flow. And so it makes sense that stimulating that kind of helps that autonomic feature and gets the enteric plexus working better. And uh, patients can have a drug-free way of trying to treat uh, the gastric stasis. It's not FDA approved for that. Uh, we're just discussing it because this paper has been published and it, it uh, gives a glimpse of of one possible benefit from using it. So right. patients who have a lot of nausea and indigestion with their, especially with their migraines, this could be uh, uh, an adjunctive or, or sole treatment for, uh, for their migraine attacks uh, with or right. without nausea. Okay, uh, I find that very interesting. The last thing we're gonna talk about today, um, it looks like we were able to learn something from a little bit of epidemiological data and commentary from the natural disaster that occurred in Japan with a lot of flooding that could help us migraine patients who knew that could happen. What did they publish related to that? Yeah, so this uh, uh, pertaining to the, the disastrous floods they had in Japan in 2018, Mm -hmm. And some researchers there looked at uh, medical records and, and medical claims and different databases so that they could understand from a population standpoint uh, what was happening to their migraine patients. And, and they were able to locate where these patients were and whether they were affected by the flood or not. And as it turns out, when they looked at comparisons of uh, prescription medicine use, comparing people who were with migraine that were unaffected by the flood uh, compared to patients who lived in the flood areas and were either displaced or severely impacted by the flood, their prescription use of acute medications went up about 70% within two months after, after the uh, flood season issues that they had. And this was sustained wow. for about a year uh, mm -hmm. afterwards. So we all know that stress and, and things like that, and sometimes inclement weather can, can trigger problems uh, with, our, uh, with our migraine patients. Uh, but this was um, uh, looking at uh, this natural disaster phenomenon, which is much more than just a rainy day, obviously. Right. Um, but we are plagued with natural disasters every time we turn around. And, and uh, you know, whether it's 
fires or hurricanes or tornadoes or floods or whatever we, we experience. Um, and having gone through a flood a few years ago in the Midwest, we it's terribly disrupting of your lifestyle. People are displaced. I had to move out of my home for three months in the summer wow. of 2019. Mm-hmm. And we had to pack up everything and move. And it was uh, it was a horrible you know experience for us. And I'm sure my migraines were <laughs> were worsened. You know, in the in the right. frenzy of it all, we didn't nobody paid any attention to it. It's just sort of like it's the thing that you have to do. But then when the, you know, everything starts to, the initial shock of it all is is kind of set in, then those migraines uh, can kick in and we start using more medications. And this is, this is a, a you know, a, a huge problem. Uh, I will point out that in the, in this journal, there was also an accompanying editorial uh, that was uh, published in there and they gave some pointers on things that we should do for preparedness. And I thought it was good advice because they, mentioned just simple things like uh, keeping your medications in a 90 day supply, you know, so if you're and keeping them, you know, in a dry place or maybe even in plastic containers or bags that, right. will, you know, if, if water's involved or the like, and you can, uh, you know, grab those if you if you need to vacate, evacuate an area like we had to, you know, you can, you can take, make sure you have that with you and that you have a supply that will last you and you know, you don't want in the middle of all that, you don't want to have to be thinking about trying to find an open pharmacy and being able to get your medication or your prescription transferred, all mm-hmm. the difficulties that go through that. Um, you know, the, it it's it's a real it's a real problem. And, you know, people have to think about that kind of stuff. So uh, I thought it was a good read and important to uh, point out uh, since we do have natural disasters that impact our, our migraine and, and uh, uh, disabling headache disorder patients. Right. Well, I thank you so much. That is interesting commentary, interesting data. Um, And I think we've probably all noticed that even just since COVID, our pharmacies aren't as responsive. They don't even have the same hours they used to have. My 24-hour pharmacy is open maybe eight hours a day now. So, you know, if you add a natural disaster to that, I mean, none of us are getting our medications as quickly as we used to anyway. So I think that's very important point uh, and very good advice. So, Thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for being here, and thank you everyone for joining us on this special news episode of Forehead's Sake. Please join us again next week on the weekly webcast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation.